Ladies, gents, non-binary friends, hold on to your butts because I am about to share with you the best thing I have ever seen in my life. your host, Sydney Davis Jr. Jr. And guys, this weekend, I found the wildest thing that I have seen in a long time. And I mean this entirely sincerely. This is a, this is a fantastic thing that I have found. So long story short, I was in Arkansas for a wedding this weekend. And I happened to stop by a Barnes and Noble at one point because there was a break between the ceremony and the reception which I actually really liked I've never been to a wedding where there was like a three-hour gap but I loved it anyway I digress so I was at Barnes and Noble and guys I found the spark notes version of the old testament I kid you not I'm looking at it right now I bought it obviously and it was only like $5.99 it is the actual spark notes brand version of the old testament they break it down characters themes, plots, motifs, all of it, just like they did all the classic books we used to read in high school. And I'm a little bit obsessed, so I wanted to share this with you. Now, we are going to be reading this um, for the first time together. I did a little bit of browsing and I highlighted some stuff, but I really haven't read in depth what this says. So apologies in advance if anybody gets offended by the things it says in here. I'm literally just reading you the Sparknotes version of the New Testament, the Old Testament, excuse me. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to break it down probably into chapters. What I think I'm going to do is a chapter on a lot of these characters that they mention from the Bible. And today we're going to start with God because I am truly, truly curious and interested how one summarizes God in Sparknotes. And according to Sparknotes, um... This is created by Harvard students for students everywhere. So it's Harvard, so you got to trust them, right? Anyway, let's just dive right in. So we're going to start with the analysis of major characters. I'm telling you guys, it's just like the spark notes that we all used in high school or uh, didn't use because we were good students and read the books front to back every time, right? Anyway, in the Old Testament, God is unique sovereign and unchanging he differs from greek gods whose faults and quarrels cause events uh i beg i beg to differ let's see if they talk about that though that i beg to differ that his thoughts and quarrels don't cause events his unchanging nature is hinted at by his names in biblical hebrew god is called yahweh meaning to be the title is similar to the title god uses with moses quote i am who i am end quote however The God presented in Old Testament does contradict himself at times. Okay, good. I was going to say that earlier, but I'm glad they're already bringing it up. In the course of two chapters in Exodus, God threatens to destroy the Israelites, relents, and then pronounces himself loving, forgiving, and slow to anger. God grants himself the power of self-description. He is whoever he says he is. Okay, good. I'm glad that they mentioned that he definitely has a moody, impactful activity going on in the Old Testament because that is his... uh, His quarrels definitely cause events. Each Bible writer gives God human characteristics. For example, God speaks. We do not know how his listeners recognize that it is he who is speaking or that what he sounds like, but God certainly embraces the ability to articulate his intentions through the human convention of language. Also, God assumes human form. He appears as an angel, as a group of three men, and as a mysterious army commander. In a sense, God takes on human qualities like a costume that can be taken off, since his specific appearance does not offer a complete picture of him. Still, these manifestations suggest that there is a fundamental humanity to the personality of Hebrew God. God casually walks in the garden with Adam and Eve. He even physically wrestles Jacob and allows Jacob to bear to beat him. Excuse me. These humble and endearing qualities of God contrast his later appearance as a pillar of fire and a thunderous mountain. The more extreme manifestations are, like the human manifestations, only a part of God's character rather than his sole mode of existence. 
So God can be a lot of things. He can call himself whatever he wants. He claims to be merciful and good after threatening to destroy everybody, but luckily deciding to back out. God's initial interaction with humankind is unsolicited. (laughs) That's a way to put it. Noah, Abraham, and Moses do not ask God to form a relationship with them. Even when God is unseen, his immense power over human fate lurks beneath the events of the Old Testament narrative. On the surface, the characters' experiences are filled with suspense. The characters submit to chance and have a desperate, irrational faith in God. Wow, that's quite a way to put it. Have a desperate, irrational faith in God. When God speaks or appears, we realize he's been in control all along, and the fear or suspense seems unfounded, trite, or comical. Amidst the gravity of human events, God's willingness to cause momentous events in order to teach a lesson shows him to be a strangely playful character. I mean, if burning down Sodom and Gomorrah with all the people still in it is a strangely playful character, then have at it. So I know that was a lot, a lot to take in, but basically what they're saying is God is written as though he is like man, but gets to decide he can be whatever he wants to be and he can look however he wants to look. He's a shapeshifter. We don't quite know what language he speaks, although he appears to speak, um, I was about to say English, which is not the case. He would have spoken Hebrew, I believe, back then, according to the writers of the Bible, as they call them. So now themes, motifs, and symbols. Themes. And underneath it says, themes are the fundamental and often universal ideas explored in a literary work. The first theme they mentioned, and one of the, I won't go over all the themes, but I thought this one was really interesting. The problem of evil is what it's called. The Old Testament both raises and attempts to answer the question of how God can be good and all-powerful, yet allow evil to exist in the world. Great question. From Adam and Eve's first disobedient act in the garden, Each biblical book affirms that human evil is the inevitable result of human disobedience, not of God's malice or neglect. So basically, the Bible really drives home that if you're evil, it's your fault. It is not from God's malice or neglect. It is you being human and disobedient. The first chapters of Genesis, the first book of the Christian Bible, depict God as disappointed or, quote, grieved, end quote, by human wickedness, suggesting that the humans, rather than God, are responsible for human evil, Genesis 6-6. Which I think is very interesting because he created man. So if he was so disappointed in the evilness of man, why would he have created them that way? Why would he have given men the option? And when I say men, I mean human beings in general, um, homo sapiens, Why would he have given us the option, quote unquote, to commit sin? If one, sin bothered him so much. Two, we committed so much of it. Three, it was so difficult to get rid of. As if you have heard in Christianity, he had to literally murder his son in order to sacrifice to himself to forgive us. It's a whole thing. Anyway, that human evil is the inevitable result of human disobedience, not of God's malice or neglect. I mean, honestly, can you imagine creating the rules and you create a rule that says you have to kill your own firstborn kid in order to forgive somebody or something that you created and gave free will to supposedly and knew what they were going to do before they did it but also you got to choose what they did it just seems it all seems just very confusing later books such as judges and kings show god's repeated attempts to sway the israelites from the effects of their evil these stories emphasize the human capacity to reject god's help implying that the responsibility for evil lies with humanity again even though he created men even though he created men with the ability to take action on their own even though he supposedly gave men free will even though he didn't have to he could have created us to be perfect and he could have created us to be sinless he still puts the blame on men. As it says here, implying that the responsibility for evil lies with humanity. The book Judges echoes with the ominous phrase, the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 3.12. So again, he created these beings. He can control what they do. He knows what they're going to do before they do them. They do something evil which they wouldn't have to be able to do if he didn't allow them to do it, but they do it anyway, and then he gets upset and he blames them for behaving evilly in a way that he doesn't like, even though he could 
instead create humans that act in a way that he likes. It's very strange. The most troublesome challenge to God's goodness, however, is the existence of natural evil, which is the undeserved destruction and pain humans often experience, which is a great point. God repeatedly instructs the Israelites to destroy entire cities, killing men, women, and children in the process. The book of Job directly questions God's implication in natural evil. God punishes Job harshly for no other reason than to prove to Satan that Job is religiously faithful. In the end, God declares to Job that God's powerful ways are beyond human understanding and should not be questioned. The book implies that God sometimes uses natural evil as a rhetorical device, as a means of displaying his power, or of proving a point in a world already tainted by human corruption. So anyone who's unfamiliar with the story of Job, uh, Job was a man who the devil and God were talking one day, and the devil was like, I bet... Job would turn away from you. And God says, no, Job would never turn away from me. And basically what ends up happening is they end up torturing him as perversely as possible. I think they, if I remember correctly, they kill his family, his entire family, like one by one, slowly. They burn down his house. They ruin everything he's ever worked hard for or loved or cared about. They destroy it. And in the end, Job still loves God. And so it proves the message that like, no matter what's going on, you should always look towards God Take with that what you will. There's also an entire book of Job. Then we're going to skip a little bit uh, to the virtue of faith. In the Old Testament, faith is a resilient belief in the one true God and an unshakable obedience to his will. Noah, Abraham, and Elijah represent the three main heroes of faith in the Old Testament. Each demonstrates his faith in God by performing seemingly irrational tasks after God has been absent from humankind for an extended period of time. So, ya boy created everyone and then dipped, is what it sounds like. God has not spoken to humans for many generations when Noah obediently builds a large, strange boat in preparation for a monumental flood. Abraham similarly dismisses the idols and gods of his religion in favor of a belief that an unseen and unnamed deity will provide a promised land for his descendants. Centuries later, the prophet Elijah attempts to rejuvenate faith in God after Israel has worshipped idols for decades. Like Noah and Abraham, Elijah developed a faith based on his ability to communicate directly with God. So it's a little bit confusing here because they say part of the virtue of true faith is the ability to believe in God when he remains unseen. But then they say that these guys communicate directly with God, right? And that's how they remain faithful. So to me, that is not the same. The kind of blind faith that you're expected to have in modern day Christianity, the kind of blind, and and I mean that most respectfully, the very blind, proofless existence of God is much different and harder to follow and harder to really believe in than literally being spoken to by God and being in direct communication with God. So it's interesting to me that these rules are set by people who could literally speak directly to God for people who will never speak to or see God in any way, form, or fashion. Seems a little unfair. Now to motifs. Motifs are reoccurring structures, contrasts, and literary devices that can help to develop and inform the text's major themes. For those of you who are new to Christianity, let me introduce you to the covenant. The covenant is basically saying, I promise to do these things if you promise to love me and you promise to follow me. That's a super duper watered down version of what the covenant is. Kind of a contractual agreement, but also a relationship between God and humanity. The covenant is a unifying structure that allows the human characters to evaluate their lives as a series of symbolic experiences. At first, the signs of the covenant are physical and external. God relates to Abraham by commanding Abraham to perform the rite of circumcision and to kill his son Isaac. In Exodus, God shows his commitment to the Israelites by miraculously separating the waters of the Red Sea and appearing in a pillar of fire. The religious laws are also symbols of the covenant. They represent customs and behavioral rules that unite the lives of the Israelites in a religion community devoted to God. Excuse me, religious community devoted to God. Moses suggests that these laws are to become sacred words that the Israelites cherish in their hearts and minds. Deuteronomy 11.18 
There is so much more to this. I really, really encourage you to go and get the spark notes of the Old Testament because I'm looking here and they break down every character. They, there's God, Abraham, Moses, David, Jacob, Joseph, Saul, Solomon, Elijah and Elisha, Adam and Eve, Noah, Isaac, Aaron, Joshua, Samson, Samuel, Absalom, Job, Rehu. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Those are new ones to me. I don't know who those are. Ahab and Jezebel, Esther and Job, who, as we spoke about earlier, was the one whose life was ruined in order to prove that he would still love God. So I just kind of wanted to go over a brief overview of who God is, what he does, questions that appear in my mind whenever I hear about God. This idea, let's kind of recap this, this idea that a, well, I say a man, but just because humans were supposedly created in God's image, if you um, if you follow the Christian doctrine. So this man, we'll call him, creates human beings that he knows will be evil ahead of time. He's omniscient and omnipotent. He knows they'll be evil ahead of time. He knows they'll disappoint him ahead of time. He knows they'll act evilly. Their inherent sin will be born with them. Yet, he still blames them for that sin. And he still punishes them for that sin. And he still calls himself loving, forgiving, and slow to anger. He grants himself the power of self-description. He is whoever he says he is. Which is interesting to me. He creates an entire human race that he knows already is going to disappoint him and that he knows already he's going to send to hell if they are sinners. And he already knows he's going to have to kill his own son in order to sacrifice enough to himself in order to forgive mankind who he created for sinning in the ways that he developed them to sin. And then on top of that, he gets to take whatever form he wants. He gets to take whatever shape he wants. He speaks directly to these gentlemen. He communicates with them directly in ways that solidifies their faith in him and their belief in him because they have heard from him and they know he exists. And yet the modern Christian or the modern human is supposed to have the exact same amount of devotion to God, even though they've never heard from God or seen God at all, even remotely similarly to the way that they did in the Bible. It's just a lot to think about. But anyway, support Sparknotes. Support Harvard students who make them. They work hard. They help all of us cheat our way through exams. And I could not be more grateful to them uh, for doing that. So buy a copy. Check it out. I probably am going to make a couple more episodes on other characters from the Bible. Because I'm very interested to see how Sparknotes breaks it down from a more secular perspective. As though it's like a work of literature. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace out, A-Town Down. What's that from? Peace out, A-Town Down. That's from something. I hope it's not vulgar. Um, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.